accendi. Ok, welcome to the first session about physiology and uh, I have the pleasure to invite uh, I'm sorry for, for the pronunciation of your name, it's very hard. Bjorn Shashensky, but sorry. And uh, please. Okay. Um, thank you very much for introducing me, and uh, good morning also from my side. Uh, today I will talk about how we can infer biological uh, fluctuations in the presence of measurement noise and what kind of patterns we see when we can look at the dynamics of single cells. So on the single cell level, there is considerable phenotypic heterogeneity. In fact, even identical promoters in the same cell can have different expression levels. The phenotypic uh, variability can in fact be beneficial on the population level because subpopulations within the general population are prepared for potential changes to the environment. A very dramatic example of this is the existence of uh, so-called persister cells in bacterial isogenic populations. So those are uh, bacteria that manage to survive antibiotic treatment while the rest of the cells die. However, I would like to come back to the microscopy picture I'm showing you on the bottom left because what I refer to as the phenotypic heterogeneity here is really the cell-to-cell -cell variability of uh, protein concentration, so in this case of fluorescent proteins. And it is important to realize that there are several stochastic processes that impact the concentration of a protein, so in this cartoon GFP. So first and maybe most obviously, proteins are produced at a fluctuating rate. And the production rate here is parameterized as the volumic production, so the production per uh, volume per unit time. However, cells are also growing at a fluctuating rate, which means that uh, all the proteins are diluted at a fluctuating rate. And finally, for low express proteins, or more generally molecules that are present at a low copy number, even the random partitioning during cell division events can contribute to the overall noise of the concentration. So we now want to study these processes uh, separately. So in order to do that, it is necessary to follow individual cells in time. And one way of doing this is to use a microfluidic device called the mother machine that traps individual bacteria in narrow channels, which allows us to uh, track cells for many generations. And in fact, the bottommost cell can be tracked for, in principle, arbitrary amounts of time. And then using some image analysis software, we obtain estimates for the cell size, here I'm plotting the log size, and the total GFP content via the total fluorescence we get for each cell over time. So here I'm plotting one uh, example in it. We now want to use this data to infer the biological fluctuations I just talked about that set the phenotypic variability. However, there's measurement noise on these estimates. And in fact, we estimate if we were to ignore the measurement noise and simply, for instance, uh, calculate the instantaneous growth rate, the error we, uh, that propagates into those estimates is on the order of the biological fluctuations we are actually interested in. So we need to separate the biological fluctuations we are interested in from the measurement noise. And just to illustrate this, I will use the synthetic data set. So I simulated cell dynamics and then added measurement noise to mimic the kind of data we would get for single cell data. So now the question is, what is the underlying instantaneous growth rate and the underlying instantaneous volumic production of GFP? Um, those two rates, so the growth rate and the production rate, give rise to the cell dynamics that we measure at, of, uh, well, of cell size and total GFP that we measure at discrete time points with a finite accuracy. <coughs> So the key idea here is to realize that measurement noise is uncorrelated in time, where we can assume that the biological fluctuations are a continuous process. So to make this more precise, for the measurement, for the measurement noise, we will assume Gaussian measurement noise with a fixed scale for the log length, where we will use 
um, gauge med measurement noise that scales with the square root of GFP itself because we expect short noise for microscopy data. However, in contrast, for the growth and production rates, we will use maximum entropy processes that are only characterized by a mean, a variance, and a correlation time. So those processes are also known as Orange and Umberg processes. Um, yes, and those processes um, will serve only as priors that will allow us to calculate posterior distributions for the true cell dynamics. So I won't have time to go into much detail here. However, we develop an iterative procedure that calculates prior distributions for all the time points where we have measurements from which we can then calculate posterior distributions for the true state of the cell at each time point. And the true state of the cell includes the log length and the GFP content, the two quantities we can measure, as well as the instantaneous growth and production rates. So this is not a trivial task, in part because growth and productions are nonlinearly coupled via the dynamics of the GFP content. However, using some fairly mild approximations, uh, we can, in fact, analytically calculate the first two moments of prior and posterior distributions. And as we can see from synthetic data, this does not compromise our estimates. So coming back to the synthetic data set I showed you before, we can now use our inference procedure, which we call real trace by now, to obtain the cell dynamics. So in this case, the dynamics of the volumic production rate. So our estimates are shown in orange, while the true underlying process we wanted to find is shown in green. I would also like to point out that uh, we not only get the most probable value for the volumic production in this case, so the mean of the posterior, but we in fact get the whole uh, posterior, so the whole covariance matrix, which also includes error bars on our, our, all our estimates. And the histogram on the right-hand side shows that the, our error bars in fact correctly reflect the uncertainty of our estimates, and we can use them when we calculate statistics in real data. So now, coming back to the mother machine experiments I introduced to you in the beginning, I will now show you a few things that we can see now that we can look at the dynamics of single cells. So um, here I'm showing you an example lineage of E. coli cells that grow on glucose and express GFP under the control of a constitutive uh, synthetic promoter. So this is a promoter that has no uh, regulatory input. I'm also showing you uh, the dynamics of the log concentration as well as the histogram of the log concentration in the bottom right. So now that we separated growth rate from production, we can ask how much would the concentration fluctuate if there were only growth fluctuations. So we can, if you will, do an in silico perturbation where we eliminate any production and division noise and look at cells that only dilute at a fluctuating rate. And as you can see, only the dilution fluctuations can in fact lead to considerable concentration fluctuations. However, the growth rate noise itself is dependent on the growth conditions. So we tested this for four different growth conditions that uh, form these four clouds in the scatter plot. And um, those uh, cover a wide range of uh, mean growth rate. And on the y-axis, I'm plotting the noise level of the growth rate. And as you can see, there's a systematic decrease uh, with the mean growth rate. On top of that, we can also ask how quickly are fluctuations decaying in the different growth conditions. And we do this by calculating the autocorrelation function of the growth rate. And here I normalize the x-axis by the mean doubling time, such that you can read one as one typical cell cycle time. And as you can see from these plots, in the slow growth conditions, for instance acetate, um, the fluctuations decay much slower than in the faster growth conditions, even relative to the cell cycle time. And these results are interesting also in the context of uh, previous theoretical work from the lab that showed that coupling the phenotypic noise uh, to the growth rate can in fact overcome some of the limitations of bed hatching. So next we looked at how growth and production are coupled. Well, you can't see that in fact. That is pity. Do you know how I, can, how I can fix this quickly? Otherwise, I can try to explain, like, sh explain what you should see. No. There should be uh, lines in the plot, basically. I don't know. 
Okay. I will continue and I will explain to you as best as I can what you should see. Um, all right. So coming back, even though you can't see anything, we calculated the cross-correlation function for uh, several promoters, including four uh, constitutive promoters. So again, promoters that had no known regulatory binding sites. And to our surprise, we saw that even though there are sort of typical patterns that are related to the growth conditions, there are significant differences between the promoters, which was really surprising to us, and at the moment we don't understand this. Well, next we looked at the um, uh, cell cycle dependency of growth and production. So first looking at the growth rate, we saw that the, the growth rate is actually slower in the first half um, of the cell cycle and then speed up towards the second half of the cell cycle. And this is irrespective of the growth condition, only the magnitude of this effect changes. And then similar to the cross-correlation functions for the systematic behavior of production uh, over the cell cycle, we saw again that there are typical patterns related to the growth conditions, but different promoters behave slightly differently. Okay, I just quickly want to mentioned that um, while we primarily use this to analyze single cell data of E. coli that was obtained using this mother machine I showed you before, this is in fact a more general method that can use for other kinds of systems as well. So for instance, we applied it to C. elegans data as well as to mouse embryonic stem cells. All right, so with that I would like to um, summarize a few points. I introduced the a Bayesian inference method that we can use to infer this true cell dynamics. And then we use this to characterize the biological fluctuations for um, in E. coli data sets, uh, including the size of growth rate fluctuations and how growth rate fluctuations are decaying, uh, as well as the cross-correlation function and the systematic cell cycle variability. So that's a pity. I will, if you're interested, come to me. I will show you these plots. I think they are quite nice. Um, yes, yeah, so with that, I would like to acknowledge a few people that contributed to this project. Um, Eric von Nimwegen, who supervised the project, and Dani Chauvin, who did all the mother machine experiments I showed you today. And I would also like to thank the entire von Nimwegen lab. And finally, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to your questions. So. So you are perfectly on time, so there is time for a few questions, if any. So I invite the people to come there or over there. It's not time, I'll just go. <laughs> okay. I can hear you. Yeah. So, uh... Well, yes, so there's the... Um... There, there, well, at least two uh, sort of main contributions to the measurement noise. So one is the finite resolution of the camera. Um, and then secondly, there is, as you said, there's the segmentation, which of course relies on the resolution of the camera. Um, so it's true that you um, could imagine that as cells move around in the mother machine channel, there might be correlation from time point to time point. And we, we didn't really see this, for instance, we only looked at every second time point to see whether the statistics change, and we couldn't see a difference. So we are thinking the sort of cells move enough in this time window between measurement, which for instance for glucose is three minutes, that this actually does not play a role. Thank you very much. Yes, so no, just, have a just question. Given that what you estimated are effective, are, are parameters of an effective model, Mm -hmm. um, now you say that, you know, this, this, has, this has to do with biology, but how much are they influenced by the geometry in which you are observing the phenomenon? Um, because, you know, they result from complex, uh, complex uh, uh, you know, uh, physics, and so it might be that the fact that you are in a channel or you let them... Okay. Yes, yes, so thank you very much for the question. So I should emphasize that we do not try to, to fit the, the process that I showed to you in the beginning, but we only use this to... Uh, provide prior distributions for all our time points. So we have a prior process that is constrained by as, le uh, sort of as few things as possible, um, so the mean variance and correlation time to obtain a continuous process. But then we let the data um, sort of convince us to, to, um, to obtain other results. And in fact, several of the things I, I wanted to show you 
are really at odds with the, or very distinct to the Ons and Umberg process that we used as a prior. For instance, we see longer correlations or sort of more complex correlations as well as cross correlations. And also they say it's like a, the variations are not part of the, the process. So I think we can sort of the data convinces the, the process to, to, to fit the biology. I had a question about uh, um, the um, patterns with the cell cycle of the different promoters, which we didn't see. Yes. But are they oscillate, like one cycle per promoter? And uh, are the promoters on the, on the genome and where? Because uh, uh, the copy number, for example, could yes. be. Yes. So maybe let me uh, answer the last, uh, the the last question first. So the, all the promoters are integrated in the same place in the genome. So it's like point, uh, 1.3 microbases away from the origin of replication. Um, so I don't, we don't think the difference comes from, the differences we see come from there. Um, the, the patterns we observe are indeed um, oscillatory, um, but they're shifting depending on the growth condition. And then there are sort of slight, slight shift as well as change in the magnitude too, depending on which promoter we're looking at. And this is true for the uh, constitutive promoters as well as the two ribosomal promoters we, we looked at. Thank you. Uh, I, have a, I have two questions. Um, uh, so you, you said you, you're trying to maximize the entropy mm -hmm. of the system. So um, uh, this, this principle it may not exactly apply to living systems. As soon as you introduce the active processes and you skew the equilibria with active processes, uh, uh, you may not be anywhere near Boltzmann or uh, uh, trying to maximize, uh, or, or the, ma the principle of maximum of entropy may not exactly apply there. And my second question is, if you are trying to, to do that, what degrees of freedom uh, do you infer there? And what are the boundaries uh, for those degrees of freedom, freedom uh, exist in your system? I'm just, I'm... Yes. Yes, so thank you very much for the question. I think it um, relates back to an earlier question that we want to constrain the process with these few constraints, and then we use the einstein unberg process that generate priors. But the, the priors are only calculated sort of between neighboring time points, and in this way we can use the information sort of from all the data points in the fu future as well as in the past to obtain posterior distributions for the time point that we have, uh, that we're interested in in the moment. So. I would not say that we want to sort of fit, a, um, that we want to, we, we are not assuming that growth or production are in fact maximum entropy processes. We just want to use a process that is as least constrained as possible and then uh, sort of let the data do what, uh, what it sort of uh, convinces the, the, the inference to do. Um, yes, I hope this answers your question. Okay, thank you. Okay, so maybe I would invite uh, the next speaker and thanks again. Is Gregory Poon. It's a five minutes uh, presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you. Hello. Okay. Bit of a challenge here. Um, so, good morning. Um, my name is Gregory Poon from Georgia State University. So, I'd like to first thank the organizers for the opportunity to come and uh, present to you our research. Um, because of the time constraint, this is necessarily going to be a very sort of high level um, summary, I guess, um, of our research. So, if you're interested, um, in what you hear in the next few minutes, uh, please feel free to reach out. Um, so our lab works on uh, hydration of macromolecular systems, and the way to kind of, I want to introduce this is to indicate to you that dynamic processes um, to osmotic stress felt by cells is a universal adaptation throughout the tree of life. So this happens, of course, because water only water and um, low molecular weight neutral solutes can be exchanged freely between um, biological membranes. And because isotonic balance is the physiologic set point for the cell, what, this, what happens is therefore 
the absolute osmotic pressure can be uh, substantially uh, perturbed um, due to external stress. Bar for bar, um, you should, uh, bar for bar, osmotic pressure is far more perturbative um, to living processes than our uh, hydrostatic pressure, so that's important to note. Uh, my lab is broadly interested in the osmotic regulation of transcription factor interactions. So transcription factors, as you know, these are proteins that mediate gene expression, and evolutionarily, they are characterized by very strong structural conservation, as you can see from the pair um, ETS1 and PU1 on the screen there. Um, one of the contributions that we've made over the past decade is to establish that um, hydration change marks a fundamental um, thermodynamic signature that can distinguish uh, between these structural homologs. So in this case, you can see uh, PU1 incorporates hydration uh, into DNA binding not to maximize high affinity um, uh, recognition of DNA, but rather to suppress low affinity binding at normal osmotic conditions. And this type of passive osmoregulation occurs in conjunction with the more familiar um, active biochemical signaling, but it's much less well understood and continues to be a major focus for our lab. A second area of interest uh, in my lab is to invert um, hydration changes uh, to osmotic pressure sensing in living cells. And we do this by uh, placing cellular reporters such as fluorescent proteins under the control of osmotically sensitive um, transcription factors like PU1. And we generate a ratio metric signal that combines both high and low affinity um, binding uh, in order to uh, get an output. This type of design has the advantage that it filters out um, uh, global perturbation to gene expression and allows us to tease out um, the differential effects due to the osmotically sensitive transcription factors. So as my time is um, coming to a close, much like Cinderella, I'm just going to uh, summarize then um, what you've heard in the last few minutes. So our lab is, is interested both in the fundamental uh, molecular biophysics of hydration, specifically with respect to protein-DNA interactions, as well as uh, broader questions in cellular osmotic stress response. Um, to close, I would just like to uh, acknowledge the graduate students and postdocs who do the work, uh, my collaborators, water, of course, and uh, a special thank you uh, to Daniel Weissman from Emory. Uh, where is Daniel? Is Daniel here? Uh, there's Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, and I'd like to thank the NIH and the NSF, who's, been, who's funded our research over the years, of course, for your attention. And I will now hand the festivities back. Thank you. One question, we can take it. If not, maybe we can move. Uh, ah. um, so, so there's also an osmotic response from the cell. So these um, uh, transcription factors are actually um, tuning their adaptation for something that is um, um, on, a, on a very short time scale, or because uh, the, the the cell will will buffer if you apply an osmotic shock after a while, uh, depending on the kind of right. So, um, so osmotic st stress response occurs on on sort of grossly two time scale. One is um, simply the the, the sort of um, biophysical response of things like um, um, uh, cell membrane proteins and things like that. With transcription factors, because you're talking about a metabolic process that involves you know, generation of mRNA and all this mRNA has to be translated, et cetera, that happens on a longer time scale, typically sort of minutes on kind of thing. So the, 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 the thing that we are interested in involving transcription factors are sort of more in the latter category, the, the, the sort of secular changes um, um, uh, from the cells over, you know, timescales from minutes to hours to days.
Okay, thanks uh, again. Thank you. And the uh, next speaker is Leonardo Miele. Hello everyone, today I'll try to give you a flavor about um, uh, fruit growth modeling work I did last year uh, as a postdoc at the INRA Avignon in France. Um, so fruit growth is a very complex uh, uh, phenomenon but ultimately it's about cells uh, um, taking up a resource, uh, growing and dividing. Um, and so to understand how cell size is regulated, normally what we do, what people do is to uh, take E. coli, observe it expanding and dividing. Uh, make hypotheses on the single cell behavior, build a mathematical model, and then compare experimental and theoretical cell size distributions. So told like this, it, it looks like a fairly simple job, but actually have to be Matteo Zella and Marco Cosentino Lago Marzino in order to, to make it things uh, properly, which of course I'm not. Um, but when it comes to fruit cells, observing them, uh, it's um, um, way more trickier than observing E. coli because you cannot attain the same uh, length and time uh, resolution and also because most of our understanding on, on plant cells is based on uh, Arabidopsis thaliana, which is basically the equivalent of E. coli in the plant uh, domain. Uh, but uh, raise your hand if you've ever uh, eaten uh, Arabidopsis thaliana's fruit. <laughs> I don't believe you. Um, but, but what about tomatoes? Everyone loves tomatoes. Voilà. And uh, it's also the most uh, uh, productive and consumed fruit uh, worldwide. So you can see why it became a biological model for the study of, flesh, of uh, fleshy fruits. It's also very simple to, to grow it. You just need good weather and a bunch of master students. And there's a lot of interest uh, in understanding how the final fruit mass, total cell number, and cell size distribution are obtained at harvest, so at the end of the day. And of course, how agricultural practices can uh, influence uh, those processes. Um, and uh, when modeling uh, such, a, such a system, you have to deal with uh, like a rather data poor environment where you at best have like snapshots of cell size distributions. So what I did is to uh, build a model, like everyone, uh, that conceptually combines on the one hand, uh, the size dependent formalism of cell expansion and division, which is uh, uh, quite common in the statistical physics community. And on the other side, uh, Sirxing's principle of uh, resource sharing between cells, which are, again, a, a rather uh, common theory in plant physiology. And we ended up with a novel class of what are called the population balance equations, uh, applied them to uh, some experiments uh, that we uh, had uh, on uh, tomato fruit grown under different uh, environmental conditions, and uh, basically seen what happened. So th this is just to give you an idea of what, uh, does the, the, what the model looks like. This is the temporal evolution, the equation for the temporal evolution of the cell size distribution. Uh, and basically, so it, it will tell something on, only to those people already uh, <coughs> friendly with uh, the PB formalism, uh, I'm sorry about that. But basically, most of the novelty is uh, inside this omega term, which is a functional term that uh, takes into account the fact that uh, cells have to uh, uh, share these, uh, these resources. Uh, we apply this to the dataset we had, and you see that it, it works very well for um, both the total cell number on the left and the total fruit mass on the right uh, as function as, uh, uh, as uh, of um, days uh, of development. Uh, we had a ch we checked uh, several uh, genotypes. Uh, the with names that you see there, and different environmental conditions, notably uh, like irrigation, uh, water deficit, or like uh, free charge, um, and also. Uh, it works pretty nice even uh, if you have uh, uh, even uh, like in a data pooler uh, situation where here just to show you that you just you don't need the entire history of the total cell number but just the final proto is is enough to get nice fits and this is nice because um, it's quite painful to to estimate uh, uh, fruit cell numbers and uh, the model also uh, provides some good estimates of the cell mass distribution at harvest so at the end of the day and <clears throat> just to point out that this this data data on, on cell mass distribution are, are not used to fit the model, so they can also uh, provide like a cross-validation of our procedure and of our assumptions. 
and uh, uh, by looking at uh, uh, how the best fit parameters, uh, uh, how, how the value, how the values shift uh, with different uh, uh, situations, one can also have uh, an idea on uh, uh, which practice which practice is affecting which parameter and then which uh, mechanistic process. So as to have a, like a little bit of an insight into the relationships between human intervention and yield, and this opens to the integration of uh, further metabolic pro uh, processes. Uh, and in general, uh, to, by this uh, we have obtained a rather general formalism that uh, we think we apply beyond fruits uh, to uh, other multicellular systems. And that's all, thanks. Question if there is. <laughs> it is. It is uh, in, in, in nature because uh, differently from uh, uh, bacterial cells, uh, plant cells, uh, they span like tenfold uh, length scale. And that, that complicates a lot of the things, both experimentally and, 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 and technically. Very quick. I, I didn't see the differential equation describing the taste. You, you can induce phenotypic control because, uh, so, uh, so if you see, of course it's not. <laughs> no, 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 that you have a lot of things going on, of course. But the idea was to, to have a, a, a rather flexible tool and, and also easy one, because if you, if you look at the literature, like models, uh, agro agronomic models, they have like at best uh, 10, 10, 20, 30 parameters. I, I didn't hear your question. I'm saying that it's important, I think, to go into the genetic. Also, yeah, 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 that's definitely. Totally agree. Okay, thanks again. Is Giorgio Tallarico for a 15 minute talk? Okay, I don't know how to. Ah, okay. okay. There is a switch over So, hello everybody, uh, my name is Giorgio Tallarico, I'm a second year PhD student, and today we'll talk about the uh, universal principle of cellular growth regulation in eukaryotes using uh, budding yeast. Uh, <clears throat> I come from the statistical physics of cells and genome group. Uh, we are a, a group that is interested like broadly on the, at the interplay between physics and biology, and we are like divided into branches. Uh, one is uh, quantitative physiology, which is where my PhD project behave, and the other one is uh, evolution or quantitative evolution. My story starts from this uh, observation. These are two plots that come from the literature. And this is that in a wide variety of species, like in uh, these plots are like data from uh, fungi, uh, molds, uh, bacteria, and other uh, species, uh, is that this RNA over protein ratio seems to scale linearly with the growth rate, and one can just wonder why it happens, why it is like this. And the first part of the answer is that, uh, is uh, noting that the, this RNA over protein ratio is constant or, or at least is proportional to the amount or the mass fraction of ribosomes inside the cell. And then if you write an equation for the protein synthesis, or at least you say that the protein synthesis is proportional to the translational efficiency of the cells times the number or the mass or the total mass of the ribosomes inside the cells, you can see that it appears this uh, linear correlation or this linear trend between the growth rate and the mass fraction of, uh, of ribosomes. 
So <coughs> going back to the first slide, uh, I highlighted like this very interesting species, which is yeast. Uh, we were particularly, particularly interested in yeast because it's an eukaryotic species. It's like a widely studied model system and is particularly interesting for us because it's a eukaryote again. And uh, we come from a cancer research institute, so for us it's very interesting about uh, the, the trade-off uh, uh, that are behind the cellular growth, the regulation, and all this kind of stuff. Um, more recently, it was shown using proteomics in uh, this 2017 paper that this linear trend between the growth rate and the ribosomal mass fraction seems to be kept uh, or at least is supported also with the proteomics data. And so from this plot, we started, we started wondering about how this growth loss emerges, or at least how does it emerges this linear trend between the growth rate and the mass fraction of ribosomes. And in particular, we are interested, at least in this first level, what are the trade-offs in protein allocation, uh, what, what, what is the role in translation in this, and how they are like coupled together, what are the trade-offs between these observables. So, if one goes into the literature, uh, you will see that uh, or, uh, some people already studied these kind of problems in bacteria, and they proposed like, uh, a model like this. This is a very phenomenological coarse grain model of a cell. And the basic idea behind this is like dividing the protein in uh, two, two, two groups of protein, or at least divide the proteins in two groups. One that is devoted to translation, or at least uh, the idea is that there are like uh, ribosomal proteins uh, that are like a proxy for Total mass, uh, to the total ribosomal mass, uh, and the other part of the proteum is metabolism, and then there's like a, another fraction of the proteum that is kept constant and is usually not, uh, is not considered. And then uh, the other idea is that the ribosomes make all the proteins, uh, including themselves, so you have these autocatalytic properties of this model, and the last, uh, the last ingredient of this model is uh, flux matching. And uh, you can think about it as like, uh, that the uh, metabolism, or at least like the proteins that produce amino acids, or in general like precursors, is uh, they produce just enough as uh, how much the ribosomes use for protein synthesis. So when you take into account all these ingredients, you have a couple of predictions in particular, or at least you have three, but one I already showed you, which is the linear trend between the growth rate and the ribosomal mass. And you have like these other two predictions that are aren't really tested in yeast. And the first one is what happens to the metab metabolism, or at least uh, like what is the, the, the allocation pattern for the, all the proteins that are devoted toward metabolism. And the second one is what happens to the ribosomal mass when you change the, tran the, the translation rate, or at least you perturb it with like, for example, a, a translation inhibitor, which is the second prediction. So starting from the first one, which is what happened to metabolism, uh, <coughs> we, we went to back to the literature. We took this uh, proteomics data from these two papers, plus the, the third one, which reused it. And uh, all these points that are depicted in this plot comes from different growth media. And the main idea is that you have like a synthetic media, and then you change the nutrient quality by basically changing the carbon source. So you have like uh, different carbon sources. You go from the faster growth rate, which are the, the, the one in glucose, or uh, for example, galactose, and like slower growth rate, which are acetate, lactate, and uh, other carbon sources like this. And then uh, you can take the proteins, you attach to them their Goslim uh, terms uh, annotation that I took from SGD, and then you can basically bunch up every, every single protein that has a role in metabolism, and then you can see that it compares, it appears this uh, linear trend between uh, the growth rate and the, um, and the, uh, the protein, uh, protein allocation, uh, uh, the protein allocation. And then uh, I looked at also what are the proteins that are involved in translation, which are again ribosomal proteins and like translation initiation factors, for example, and other proteins. So for the second prediction, <coughs> which is what happens when you change the translation rate by, for example, using a translation inhibitor, and this is what we did. Uh, we used the cyclohexamide, and we checked this by using this <coughs> construct, which has a ribosomal, uh, an essential ribosomal protein that is fused with IGFP, and we looked at the expression level of IGFP in, uh, in a bunch of different conditions. So the, the green points are when I uh, change the nutrient quality by changing the carbon source, and I've written uh, with, uh, with the points the the carbon source that I used, and then at the, when you fix your growth media, so for example in uh, trialose, uh, synthetic media plus trialose or synthetic media plus galactose, you can add multiple concentration of cyclohexamide and try to see at the expression level of the essential ribosomal proteins, which I forget to say, but uh, we used it as a proxy 
for the allocation of ribosomes. And what you, will, uh, what you see from this plot is that uh, it seems that the expression level of this protein seems to increase uh, with, the, with the amount of translation inhibitors that I gave to my cells, uh, which is something that, is, uh, that support the model that I showed you before. Uh, we looked at this also by measuring the RNA over protein ratio, as in the, in the introduction. And the data are less clear, but uh, you, can, you can also see that the, 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 the trend is increasing with the amount of uh, with perturbation that was done with, the, with cyclohexamide. So <clears throat> after this, we went back to the force growth law, which is the linear trend between the growth rate and the ribosomal mass fraction. And we looked uh, more carefully at what is sigma, this parameter. Uh, it was very vague in the introduction. I called it translational efficiency or translation rate, but is it? or at least uh, what the, the linearity of the growth law seems to imply is that the, um, the translation rate should be constant across condition. And so we went uh, again into the literature and we found that these uh, people from the ZID lab at the USD, they developed an assay for measuring the translation elongation rate in vivo, which is basically measuring the speed at which the ribosome is like uh, elongating the peptide chain, so the speed at which you are adding amino acid to your peptide chain, and we use this assay for measuring the, the elongation rate across condition, again, when changing the nutrient quality of my growth media. And what you can see is that this, um, this elongation rate is increasing with the growth rate, uh, again, uh, contrasting the hypothesis of the constant translation rate, but this was also served in, uh, was also served in, in, uh, in bacteria and it's something that you can add back in the, in the model, or at least in bacteria, you can add it back by considering like VGPP regulation and uh, like this. So for concluding, these are the take home messages from uh, my presentation, or at least the first results that I got, <coughs> and is that ribosomal mass and meta uh, the metabolic mass uh, allocated are, uh, seems to show this coordinated allocation that, uh, that is predicted by these uh, two, two sector uh, allocation scheme of the proteome. Uh, then we saw that the ribosome allocation seemed to increase when you titrate uh, or at least you perturb translation by means of uh, translation inhibitors. And then the, the translation elongation rate uh, increased with the nutrient quality. And uh, with this, I would like to thank all the people that are involved in this project. So all the people in my group that I, uh, there are some people that are directly involved in this and other people which I talked about a lot. Uh, discuss with them and uh, all the people from the Genome Integrity Lab, which are the, my experimental supervisor. And with this, I would like to thank you, everybody, for your attention. And yeah. Okay, time for questions. Yeah. I'm about to go over around for about 10 years or so, as you mentioned. Yeah. Has there been any progress on actually determining the coefficients in some type of more network scale model of metabolism or translation or whatever, or is it still, or is it still hopeless and it's just a question of measuring and seeing if the linear laws apply or not? Uh, you mean the parameters yeah, like? Yeah, it's sort of like, you know, we know the current is more than the low energy field, but sometimes we're actually going to calculate the Yeah. So I mean, I mean the, the idea, or at least like the main idea of my PhD project is doing this, but in yeast, like measuring every single parameter from scratch and like trying to see if like what happens for bacteria uh, is uh, you can compare it with what happens to yeast. At least so far for us, like yeast is equal to bacteria for, for my first results, which is like, for me is shocking because like it's super different the two organisms, but yeah. For, thanks for the nice talk. Um, <clears throat> so your focus was on translation, but there is also work, uh, including from your group, about the role of transcription. Can you comment on how that would fit into this picture? So f for now, we are like more, more on the hypothetical size, uh, hypothetical side, sorry. But yeah, we would like to integrate like uh, translation initiation, like tr try to measure like mRNA concentration, and try to see what happens basically. And try, I mean, now we are more in a stage where we try to measure everything, and then at a certain point, we would like to group everything together and try to see what, is it, what really matters and what really not matters in yeast. But yeah, I mean, it's on the bucket list. So, okay, no other questions. So let's thank the speaker again.
answering this one. Okay, now we have Philip Fuchs. It's a five minutes presentation. Okay, so hello everybody. I'm uh, Philip Fuchs. And uh, yeah, so today I'm presenting on my work on uh, bacterial growth and uh, biosynthetic fluxes. So basically, I'm working on cell growth and uh, gene expression involved in it, and specifically on uh, transcription and translation fluxes. So compared to the last question, that's a bit uh, an answer of. Uh, how transcription, the role of transcription in uh, translation and growth. So we look at um, cell growth as an output parameter, and we look at this in different uh, conditions. So if you have a, a good carbon source, so good nutrients, you will have a cell with a lot of ribosomes, so a lot of protein production and a high growth rate. While if you have a poor nutrient, you will have a lower amount of ribosomes and lower growth rates. And this relation between the number of ribosomes and uh, growth rates is um, observed uh, quite uh, universally, so in different uh, species and different conditions, so much that it has uh, this phenomenological relation has gained the name of uh, growth law. So from this phenomenolo phenomenological relation, we want to make a more mechanistic model, which uh, involves both translation and transcription to get back to cell growth. So we use um, um, mechanistic uh, fluxes to um, describe it, and those uh, fluxes can saturate. So from this, we already predict a phase diagram of uh, the different uh, growth regimes depending on your concentration of ribosomes and RNA polymerase, with um, so the light gray area being the uh, bacterial growth regime you will find in most normal exponential growth conditions, while the top right would be a condition where you would have linear growth. Linear growth that you indeed observe in different species um, when you are uh, limited by your genes, so uh, you are in a DNA replication arrest. So we two examples where we observe um, linear growth, and we can just uh, predict this by the saturation of both translation and transcription. So this model, we use it to um, to predict the, um, the physiology of the cell in different conditions. And indeed, in normal conditions, we can predict uh, both ribosome and RNAP concentrations in different conditions. And for, um, uh, so this is the data of uh, Balakrishnan and, and our model with no fitting parameters. And for the linear growth, we do predict the shift to um, uh, linear growth. So this is for yeast. Um, when, uh, when DNA replication is stopped. So of course here I didn't have time for any details in, on the mechanistic uh, relations. So if you have any questions, uh, please contact me afterwards. And uh, until then, thank you for your attention. Questions? Thank you, thank you for the talk. I just wanted a bit more details about the phase space that you showed, uh, since, of course, the amount of minutes that you had. Okay. So what, what do you see and how you can yeah, uh, link uh, translation and... and, and uh, tr yeah. Um, well, they're both linked through the fact that uh, translation is, the, is, your, is um, determined by your ribosomes, but also your concentration of mRNAs. And so um, in most cases, so in the complex formation uh, phase, you, the important thing is your ribosomes and slightly your, your mRNAs. But if your mRNAs are very, very, if your concentration of mRNAs is very small, then you will have too many ribosomes per mRNA. And so you will be limited by mRNA. And that is how you get to transcription limited or uh, linear growth, such that if you don't have uh, so that you get through um, gene limitation. So if you don't have a lot of genes, you don't have a lot of transcription, you don't have a lot of mRNA. If you don't have a lot of RNA, mRNA, you don't have a lot of protein production. So that's how, how we link the two together. Uh, 
naive question. So what limits growth when you have a, a lot of food, like uh, everything you need? Like, because, uh, so if you have everything you need, you're in complex formation and limited growth. So that's where the, um, the limiting a step on growth is uh, mRNA and ribosomes getting together. So, I mean, even if you, so if you increase your ribosomes, you will have more growth. If you increase your mRNAs, you will have more growth. So that's the uh, condition you have in most biological Is it literally the transport of the RNA to the ribosome? Yes, but even then, if you increase, because you have a slight amount of mRNAs that are um, not bound, but could be, so not bound to mRNA, but could be. So if you increase your mRNAs, you will have a slight increase in translation. Okay, so let's move to the next speaker then. Let's thank again the... with Silvia Vareski, it's five minutes presentation, so please. Okay, hi everybody, I'm Silvia from Rosalind Hallen Group in, in uh, Jena, and uh, my, stories of my, uh, my story of today is a story about biofilms that are dense surface attached bacterial communities that are typically difficult to treat with antibiotics and a flux pump that are a, re a resistance mechanism that allow um, bacteria to pump antibiotic out of the cell, and they are typically really expressed in biofilms. And my question in particular is, how do efflux pumps affect intercellular interactions in a dense population? So uh, let's start with a, a crude approximation. We can see a uh, population of bacteria has just two compartments exchanging antibiotic with uh, the environment with ratio P in and P out. And uh, we look at the stationarity at, uh, um, at the in intracellular antibiotic concentration, I dimensionalize by the concentration that we would have in the system when the two rates, when there is no bias in the pumping, uh, in the import and export rates. And this quantity can be seen as an effective pumping efficiency that, uh, at, uh, the, uh, that depends on the cell volume fraction rho and uh, on the uh, uh, properly said, pumping efficiency, Q, uh, and that is defined as the ratio between the uh, export and import uh, rates. So what we get is that uh, at very low density, the effective pumping efficiency and the pumping efficiency are the same. But as we increase the, uh, the density, we get a kind of homogeneous population correction. And what does it mean? It means that when Q is uh, smaller than one, uh, Inefficient cells cooperate in order to, let's say, share the malus. But when Q is larger than one, actually they pollute each other, such that at high density, a much larger pumping efficiency Q is needed to recover the same antibiotic uh, depletion. Also, as we increase the density, um, at high density, a small variation in the density will require a much larger variation in the pumping efficiency Q in order to, uh, to recover the same, pump, um, the same antibiotic depletion. In case of an of a heterogeneous system, we just uh, can imagine more compartments where um, population I will, have a will be in a fraction Fi and pumping efficiency Qi, generically, and this will imply a further correction uh, that uh, complicates things a bit. So indeed, what we see is that there will be a region in the space of pumping efficiency I and J where the I density becomes a benefit for the whole population, otherwise it will become a cost of the whole population. Also, the picture that emerged is that uh, inefficient population, uh, inefficient cells, uh, wants to be the majority of the whole population, while very efficient cells want to be the minority of the population. And this can be seen also if we look at how composition of the whole population can affect the, um, uh, the antibiotic depletion of cells. For example, a, a switch of inefficient cells 
to more efficient cells, though increasing the number of uh, more efficient cells will also decrease the uh, pumping efficiency of the whole population involved. This suggests that uh, we, um, upon introducing some constraint in, in our model, we may identify optimal cells sets of configuration of the system, and it also suggests uh, that uh, um, the role of density or as a possible explanation of the efflux expression in biofilms. It also suggests as the importance of looking at diffusion-limited antibiotic absorption in dense biofilm as uh, a scenario where, uh, where such interaction can emerge. And with this, uh, I thank you for attention, for, for the organization, I, I thank also my group and collaborators. Um, I, I, maybe I missed it, but does cell death play a role in this process? Because uh, um, if cells can die, maybe they can also release the antibiotics and this. Yeah, this Is there another question? Quick one. If not, we can move. We can move on. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Okay, last uh, speaker of the session, so a 15 minutes talk for uh, Damiano Andreghetti, so please. Okay, hi everyone, and uh, I'm Damiano Andreghetti, I'm a PhD student in uh, Politecnico di Torino, and I'm glad to be here to present you our work on uh, uh, molecular sorting on fluctuating membranes. And um, uh, inside cells, each task is carried out by specific proteins and chemical factors. And in order to counter the homogenizing effect of diffusion, these biomolecules have to be properly separated. And here are depicted uh, three examples of this, both during uh, asymmetric cell division, during cell migration, or during the morphogenesis of a tissue. We need biomolecules to properly separate in order to carry out these functions. And uh, here, as an illustration, is depicted a multicellular structure. This is a microtubule. And uh, in blue are different nuclei from different cells. And uh, in green and red are two different proteins with two different functions. And you can see that in order to maintain this multicellular structure inside each cell, these two proteins, the green and the red one, need to be placed in a precise way. However, both the green and the red proteins are synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum. And uh, then in the top layer of the Golgi apparatus, they are sorted into lipid vesicles, which are enriched in either the green or the red proteins. And these vesicles are then delivered to the appropriate uh, place inside the cell. During the formation of these vesicles, the biomolecules that uh, are sorted attach on the lipid membrane and they laterally diffuse on it. And uh, due to direct and indirect interactions, they form aggregates, domains, and these domains grow and uh, through proteins that promote the membrane bending and the membrane fission, these molecules are packed into lipid vesicles. And from a molecular point of view, this is a very complicated process. However, if we see this from a minimal statistical physics perspective, we abstract from molecular details and uh, see the process from a mesoscopic scale, we can see this as an out of equilibrium process where we have molecules that enter the system, which is the membrane, and then they laterally diffuse, they form these domains, and these domains grow, 
due to various interactions, and uh, then once they reach a certain size, they are removed from the system, from the membrane. So we have a flux phi of particles through the system. And uh, when the process reaches a steady state, we know that the average molecule density on the membrane is equal to the mean residence time of molecules times the flux phi of molecules through the system. And this relation is important because it allows us to study the efficiency of the process in terms of time spent by the molecules on the membrane, measuring the density of molecules on the membrane. Some simulations were run about this process, and uh, it was found that the optimal, the more efficient regime is found for intermediate direct interaction. Indeed, for two-week direct interactions, these molecules spend most of their time freely diffusing, and it's hard for them to form domains. While for two strong direct interactions, these molecules are so sticky that they form so many domains, and these domains congest the system, and they compete with each other. So the optimal scenario is found in between these two regimes with, the, with uh, an intermediate strength of direct interaction. And uh, a phenomenological theory was developed for this process, and uh, this uh, theory explains this uh, optimal sorting regime in terms of an optimal rate of domain nucleation. Then, also some experiments were run about this uh, process, and were me measured some quantities predicted by the theory, and the experiments were found to be in agreement with them. Here is plotted the domain size distribution. And uh, up to now, however, the membrane was treated as a static membrane. However, biological membranes are known to fluctuate, and uh, this fluctuation gives rise to many non-trivial phenomena especially in the presence of biomolecules like protein that are attached on the membrane. So we wanted to study this aspect. And uh, the main component of a biomembrane is the lipid bilayer, which uh, on a mesoscopic scale can be represented as a surface in three dimension. And to this surface, we associate this Hamiltonian, the so-called canum helfrich Hamiltonian, which describes the thermal fluctuations at equilibrium of the surface. In this Hamiltonian, we have K and K bar, which are two, uh, two uh, rigidities associated to the mean and to the Gaussian curvature. And C1 and C2 are the principal curvatures, and C0 is the spontaneous curvature, while the integral is over the infinitesimal patch ds, all over uh, the whole surface. I told you about some uh, non-trivial uh, re um, phenomena related to these fluctuations, and in particular we focused on the fact that when we have proteins attached on the membrane, these proteins are stiffer than the surrounding membrane. And these uh, objects suppress so some of the membrane fluctuations, and this gives rise to an attractive entropy-driven interaction between the objects. And uh, these forces are also called Casimir-like forces due to the analogy with the quantum Casimir effect. Uh, in particular, uh, if we have two disks of radius capital R at distance small r, and uh, we have try to evaluate the, interac the effective interaction that arises between them when these disks are far away, more far, uh, the distance between them is larger than their size in particular. Uh, through some field theoretic, field theoretic techniques, we can uh, find this interaction and get this result, where A is a prefactor which uh, depends on the rigidity of the disk. And uh, the more rigid are these disks, the stronger is this interaction. However, when uh, the interaction of the disks goes to infinity, meaning that they locally suppress all membrane fluctuations, uh, this prefactor saturates to six, which is not a large number, in the sense that if, we are, uh, if this formula is uh, valid for the, uh, the long-range regime, for large separations, then uh, this interaction energy reduces to just a fraction of the thermal energy. So the question is, are these entropic forces relevant? And we try to evaluate the short-range uh, behavior of these forces, and um, since the analytical formula is just for long-range uh, regime, and uh, we measure the bias of a molecule diffusing in the vicinity of a disk. And uh, this is the result. On the y-axis is the fraction of times that the molecules moved in the direction of the disk. So for an unbiased walk, if the particle can move in four directions, this is one-fourth. While on the x-axis, we have the distance from the disk of the molecule, and the different curves correspond to different rigidities 
of the disk and of the cure and of the molecule. So we can see that uh, the more rigid are the molecules, the more they, experiences, they experience a bias that drives them towards the domain. So actually, these forces may be weak at a long range, but at a short range, they make the molecule experience a strong bias. They, these forces are relevant as, at a short range. And uh, the question is, how does this uh, affect the sorting that uh, I told you before about? We have mainly two ideas. The first is that uh, this will, of course, change the critical radius for domain nucleation, uh, reducing it. And this will shift the optimal, uh, the more efficient sorting region. And uh, moreover, these additional forces will drive uh, molecules towards the domain differently, since before molecules were just uh, driven randomly by diffusion towards the domain. We try to evaluate this last uh, uh, aspect through a stationary Fokker Planck equation, and that is the result. Phi is the flux of molecules that go towards the domain, and L is the molecule density far from the domain, and NR is the molecule density at the border of the domain. And this last quantity decreases with direct interaction. And the UR term is the entropic force uh, uh, appearing uh, that I showed you before. And, uh, okay. <laughs> so when we have large direct interaction, these NR terms, NR term is almost zero. So the exponential, where we have the entropic forces, play almost no role. While when we have uh, da weak direct interactions, this NR term becomes relevant. Therefore, these entropic forces may play a role enhancing the sorting, making the flux towards the domain larger. Eventually, we ran simulation of the whole sorting process on a fluctuating membrane. So we have molecules that uh, arrive on the membrane, they impose locally a, a rigidity, they laterally diffuse, they form domains, and this domain gets extracted. We reach a stationary state, and we measure the density at the stationary state. And this is the result. On the y-axis is the average molecule density on the membrane. And the lower it is, the more efficient is the process. And uh, on the x-axis is the direct interaction strength. And the different curves correspond to different rigidities of, this <coughs> of these molecules. So to different strengths of these, of these uh, entropic forces. We can see that indeed the uh, optimal sorting region is shifted and that the main, um, the, the area where these entropic forces may play the main role is uh, the weak direct interaction uh, regime. While for a strong direct interaction regime, these forces play almost no role. And uh, this uh, is relevant also because uh, the weak direct interaction regime is uh, probably the most uh, relevant one from a biological point of view. And uh, so the conclusion are this one, so that the uh, sorting is more efficient when we have an intermediate strength of the direct interaction, which is quite unintuitive, and uh, that uh, these entropic forces play a role, especially in the weak direct interaction regime. And uh, we have so also some ideas for the future, but I don't want to bother you. <laughs> and that's it. Thanks. Questions over there? Ah, okay, that's uh, one uh, thing we want to study in particular in future. That is a more tricky question because these uh, uh, curvature-driven forces uh, display a sh short-range attractive uh, behavior while a repulsive long-range behavior, if I remember well. So this makes the, the whole thing more complicated. However, it is relevant. For example, clatrin, which is a protein that uh, coats the molecules, is uh, rigid and curved. So this is an aspect that is... Uh, very important to study. Is that can? Okay. Uh, uh, exist some uh, experimental results and uh, However, the, the difficulty is to disentangle these forces from all the other forces that are playing inside the membrane, since uh, uh, we have molecules that uh, have uh, maybe a weak uh, electrostatic interaction between them. 
then there are uh, forces driven by the uh, entropy driven but by uh, the tail of the lipids for example if we have a different composition of lipids on the membrane so there are uh, some uh, um, experimental result about these forces uh, uh, okay uh, the last uh, uh, two are the the one that I found but uh, it's difficult to tell that they are actually measuring those forces. Thank you for the talk. I have a related question, sort of. Can you imagine the experiment measuring these forces? Okay. Uh, yes, but uh, just because I saw those. <laughs> uh, if, I remember, if I remember well, there they have a membrane where they put a random uh, homogeneous composition of uh, um, different uh, lipids. One is uh, uh, a softer lipid and one is cholesterol, which is uh, slightly stiffer. And they observe that uh, during time they form these, uh, they call them rafts, which are these uh, domains of uh, cholesterol. And uh, that is one idea. I don't know what could be another, honestly. <laughs> Any other molecular simulation? Uh, yes, uh, if some rigidities of molecules are known, are, have been me measured uh, through other techniques, so we can maybe insert them in our simulations and see what is the effect. That's uh, something that uh, we could do. <laughs> we try to do that for cluttering. Yeah, so uh, my question, uh, these Casimir forces uh, were derived for the Gaussian free field. The formula that is shown for the for the Casimir forces, so this formula was derived for the Gaussian free field, uh, and and as far as I understand, in, in the framework of your model, it corresponds to Gaussian Gaussian, Gaussian membrane. Gaussian membrane. 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 So uh, non quadratic terms in 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 the shape of the membrane. How do they affect your result? Okay, most of analytical results are found for the quadratic Hamiltonian, which means that we are in a small fluctuation regime. This is also quite accurate for most uh, biological membranes since uh, there is also a surface tension that keeps the memory fluctuation low. So it's uh, reasonable to approximate up to second order in the gradient of the height of the membrane, of the fluctuations. So uh, for maybe for a free membrane in a high temperature regime where there are large fluctuations, this can become relevant, relevant but uh, most of uh, analytical studies are uh, for the quadratic Hamiltonian, and uh, I think because also it, it's the only feasible <laughs> way to do that. Yes. I, want, I wonder if you take into account also the curvature of the invagination when uh, these clusters are taken out of the membrane. Uh, no, the, not me. Uh, there is a, um, a master thesis student that is working on that, but uh, in our model, we completely uh, ignore what happens when the uh, cluster is removed. So to, also there is a, a question, when molecules are removed, also some lipids are removed. So this involves uh, many other questions about is the, uh, the size of the member stationary or just it uh, decreases in time? And uh, that's a, a nice part to investigate. So we are going through that slowly. The terrace and the Jakub, do you have something? Yes, so you can follow Marco for the coffee break and uh, for people that uh, are in the next session.